Welcome back. Let's read this. Traitorous 8. The Traitorous 8 was a group of eight employees who left Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory in 1957 to found Fairkilt Semiconductor. William Shockley had in 1956 recruited a group of young PhD graduates with the goal to develop and produce new semiconductor devices. While Shockley had received a Nobel Prize in Physics and was an experienced researcher and teacher, his management of the group was authoritarian and unpopular. This was accentuated by Shockley's research focus not proving fruitful. After the demand for Shockley to be replaced was rebuffed, the eight left to form their own company. Shockley described their leaving as a betrayal. The eight who left Shockley Semiconductor were Julius Blank, Victor Greinig, Jean Huerney, Eugene Kleiner, Jay Last, Gordon Moore, Robert Noyce, and Sheldon Roberts. In August 1957, they reached an agreement with Sherman Fairkild, and on the 18th of September, 1957, they formed Fairkild Semiconductor. The newly founded Fairkild Semiconductor soon grew into a leader in the semiconductor industry. In 1960, it became an incubator of Silicon Valley and was directly or indirectly involved in the creation of dozens of corporations, including Intel and AMD. These many spin-off companies came to be known as Fair Cauldron. Initiation, Edit In the winter of 1954-1955, William Shockley, an inventor of the transistor and a visiting professor at Stanford University, decided to establish his own mass production of advanced transistors and Shockley diodes. He found a sponsor in Radian but Radian discontinued the project after a month. In August 1955, Shockley turned for advice to the financier Arnold Beckman, the owner of Beckman Instruments. Shockley needed $1 million. $1 million in 1955 is about $11 million in 2023. Beckman knew that Shockley had no chance in the business but believed that Shockley's new inventions would be beneficial for his own company and did not want to give them to his competitors. Accordingly, Beckman agreed to create and fund a laboratory under the condition that its discoveries should be brought to mass production within two years. The new department of Beckman Instruments took the name Shockley Semiconductor Laboratories. The hyphen was conventional in those years. During 1955, Beckman and Shockley signed the deal, bought licenses on all necessary patents for $25,000, and selected the location in Mountain View, near Palo Alto, California. Though Shockley did recruit four PhD physicists, William W. Happ, from Radian Corporation, George Smoot Horsley and Leopoldo B. Valls, both from Bell Labs, and Richard Victor Jones, a fresh Barclay graduate, the location provided limited enticement for new employees. The vast majority of semiconductor-related companies and professionals were based on the East Coast, so Shockley posted ads in the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune. Early respondents included Sheldon Roberts of Dow Chemical, Robert Noyce of Philco, and Jay Last, a former intern of Beckman Instruments. The newspaper campaign brought some 300 responses, and 15 people, including Gordon Moore and David Allison, Shockley himself recruited at a meeting of the American Physical Society. Selection continued throughout 1956. Shockley was a proponent of social technologies, which later led him to eugenics and asked each candidate to pass a psychological test, followed by an interview. Blank, Last, Moore, Noyce, and Roberts started working in April, May, and Kleiner, Greinick, and Huerney came during the summer. By September 1956, the lab had 32 employees, including Shockley. Each successful candidate had to negotiate his salary with Shockley. Kleiner, 
noise, and Robert settled for $1,000 per month. The less experienced last got $675. Huerney did not bother about his payment. Shockley set his own salary at $2,500 and made all salaries accessible to all employees. Traitorous 181956, Education and Work Experience The members of the future Traitorous 8 were aged between 26, last, and 33, Kleiner, and six of them held PhDs who Ernie was an experienced scientist and gifted manager, and, according to Bolajek, matched Shockley in intellect. Only Noyce was involved in semiconductor research, and only Greinick had experience in electronics. Research Strategy, Edit Throughout 1956, most members of the lab were assembling and tuning the equipment, and pure scientists who Ernie and Noyce carried out individual applied research. Shockley refused to hire technical staff believing that his scientists should be able to handle all technological processes. After resettlement, he focused on fine-tuning Shockley diodes for mass production, and five employees, led by Noyce, continued the work on a field-effect transistor for Beckman instruments. Shockley refused to work on bipolar transistors, which later was proven a strategic mistake. Because the work on Shockley diodes took so much effort the produced devices were commercial failures. According to Noyce and Moore, as well as David Brock and Joel Shurkin, the shift from bipolar transistors to Shockley diodes was unexpected. Shockley initially planned to work on the mass production of diffusion bipolar transistors, but then set up a secret project on Shockley diodes and in 1957 stopped all works on bipolar transistors. The reasons for this turn are unknown. According to Beckman's biographer, Shockley regarded his diode as an interesting scientific problem, and chose it, neglecting Beckman's commercial interests. Bolajek, based on the archives of Shockley, believes that Shockley Labs never worked on bipolar transistors, that Shockley diodes were Shockley and Beckman's original target, for which Beckman instruments received military R&D contracts, and that Shockley diodes could have found widespread use in telephony if Shockley had improved their reliability. Frictions, edit. Historians and colleagues generally agree that Shockley was a poor manager and businessman. From early childhood he was prone to outbursts of unprovoked aggression, which were suppressed only due to the internal discipline of his past working environment. He also tended to see rivals, even in his own subordinates. On the 1st of November, 1956, it was announced that the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics would be awarded to Shockley, Bardeen, and Brattain. The related public events of November-December overtired Shockley and took him away from the lab at a time when it had several management problems. Despite the festivities, the atmosphere in the lab was unhealthy. Although Shockley was never diagnosed by psychiatrists, historians characterized Shockley's state of mind in 1956-1957 as paranoia or autism. All phone calls were recorded and the staff was not allowed to share their results with each other, which was not feasible since they all worked in a small building. Shockley, not trusting his employees, was sending their reports to Bell Labs for double-checking. At some point, he sent the entire lab for a lie detector test, though everyone refused. The team started losing its members, starting with Jones, a technologist, who left in January 1957 due to a conflict with Greinick and Huerney. Noyce and Moore then stood on different sites, Moore led the dissidents, whereas Noyce stood behind Shockley and tried to resolve conflicts. Shockley appreciated that and considered Noyce as his sole support in the group. Resignation, edit. Borden Moore in 2004. In March, 1957, Kleiner, 
who was beyond Shockley's suspicions, asked permission ostensibly to visit an exhibition in Los Angeles. Instead, he flew to New York to seek investors for a new company, and his parents, New York residents, assisted him. Kleiner was supported by Blank, Greinick, Last, Roberts, Huerney and more. Arthur Rock and Alfred Coyle from Hayden, Stone and Company became interested in the offer, believing that trainees of a Nobel laureate were destined to succeed. As a last resort, on the 29th of May 1957, a group led by Moore presented Arnold Beckman with an ultimatum, solve the Shockley problem or they would leave. Moore suggested finding a professor position for Shockley and replacing him in the lab with a professional manager. Beckman refused, believing that Shockley could still improve the situation, later regretting this decision. In June 1957, Beckman finally put a manager between Shockley and the team, but by then seven key employees had already made their decision. At the last minute they were joined by Noyce. Roberts persuaded him to attend the meeting of the California group, as they called themselves in the agreement with Fairkild. The meeting was held at the Clift Hotel in San Francisco and was attended by Rock and Coyle. These ten people became the core of a new company. Coyle, a rudder-faced Irishman with a fondness for ceremony, pulled out ten newly minted one-dollar bills and laid them carefully on the table. Each of us should sign every bill, he said. These dollar bills, covered with signatures, he explained, would be their contracts with each other. Finding investors proved to be difficult. The U.S. electronics industry was concentrated in the East, and the California group preferred to stay near Palo Alto. In August 1957, Rock and Coyle met with the inventor and businessman Sherman Fairkild, founder of Fairkild Aircraft and Fairkild Camera. Fairkild sent Rock to his deputy, Richard Hodgson. Hodgson, risking his reputation, accepted the offer and within a few weeks completed all paperwork. The capital of the new company, Fairkild Semiconductor, was divided into 1,325 shares. Each member of the traitorous eight received 100 shares, 225 shares went to Hayden, Stone and Co and 300 shares remained in reserve. Fairkild provided a loan of $1.38 million. To secure the loan, the traitorous eight gave Fairkild the voting rights on their shares, with the right to buy their shares at a fixed total price of $3 million. On the 18th of September, 1957, Blank, Greinick, Kleiner, Last, Moore, Noyce, Roberts, and Huerney resigned from Shockley Labs. They became known as the Traitorous Eight, though it is not known who coined the term. Shockley could never understand the reasons for this defection. After that time, he never talked to Noyce again, but continued to follow the work of the Eight. He also combed through all records left by the eight, basing patents, held as Shockley Labs intellectual property, on any important ideas. Technically, in accordance with US law, those patents were issued to the respective inventing employees. In 1960, with the help of a new team, Shockley brought his own diode to serial production, but time had been lost and competitors had already come close to the development of integrated circuits. Beckman sold the unprofitable Shockley Labs to investors from Cleveland. On the 23rd of July, 1961, Shockley was seriously injured in a car crash, and after recovery left the company and returned to teaching at Stanford. In 1969, IT&T, the new owners of Shockley Labs, moved the company to Florida. When the staff refused to move, the lab ceased to exist. Split, edit. We were all focused on the single goal of producing our first product, a double diffused silicon Mesa transistor. We were all very young, 
27 to 32, only a few years beyond our school days. We were a very compatible group and spent a lot of time outside our working hours. Most of the founders were married, busy starting their families and raising small children in addition to all the time and effort they were spending building Fair Killed. I am struck by what a remarkable time it was and what innovative opportunities. JT. Last, 2010. In November, 1957, the eight moved out of Greinecker's garage into a new, empty building on the border of Palo Alto and Mountain View. Their starting salaries ranged from $13,800 to $15,600 per year. Hodgson, who headed the board of directors, suggested Noyce as the operational manager of the company, but Noyce refused. Fairkild, knowing Noyce's personality, also opposed his leadership. Regardless of the will of Fairkild, Noyce, and Moore, who were responsible for the research and production, respectively, became the leaders among equals. The group immediately set a clear goal to produce an array of silicon diffusion Mesa transistors for digital devices, utilizing the research results of Bell Labs and Shockley Labs. More, who early and last led three teams working on three alternative technologies. The technology of Moore resulted in a high yield of operational NPN transistors, and in July-September 1958, they went into mass production. The release of PNP transistors of Huerni was delayed until early 1959. This created the more Huerni conflict at Fairkild, Moore ignored the contribution of Huerni, and Huerni believed that his work was unfairly treated. However, the more transistors formed the prestige of Fairkild Semiconductor for several years, they beat all the competitors. In 1958, Fairkild Mesa transistors were considered for the D17B Minute MLI guidance computer, but they did not meet military standards of reliability. Fairkild already had a solution in the planar technology of Huerni proposed on the 1st of December, 1957. In the spring of 1958, Huerni and Last were spending nights on experiments with the first planar transistors. The planar technology later became the second most important event in the history of microelectronics, after the invention of the transistor, but in 1959 it went unnoticed. Fairkild announced the transition from Mesa to planar technology in October, 1960. However, Moore refused to credit this achievement to Huerni, and in 1996 even attributing it to unnamed Fairkild engineers. In 1959, Sherman Fairkild exercised his right to purchase shares of the members of the traitorous eight. Jay Last recalled, in 2007, that this event happened too early and turned former partners into ordinary employees, destroying the team spirit. In November, 1960, Tom Bay, the vice president of marketing at Fairkild, accused Last of squandering money and demanded termination of Last's project of developing integrated circuits. Moore refused to help Last, and Noyce declined to discuss the matter. This conflict was the last straw. On the 31st of January, 1961, Last and Huerni left Fairkild and to head Amelco, the microelectronics branch of Teledyne. Kleiner and Roberts joined them after a few weeks. Blank, Greinick, Moore, and Noyce stayed with Fairkild. The traitorous eight split into two groups of four. Heritage, edit. See also, Silicon Valley. From 1960-1965, Fairkild was the undisputed leader of the semiconductor market, both technologically and in terms of sales. Early 1965 brought the first signs of management problems. In November 1965, the creators of integrated operational amplifiers Bob Widler and David Talbot left for National Semiconductor. In February 1967, 
they were followed by five top managers who disagreed with Noyce. Noyce started litigation with shareholders and effectively removed himself from the operational management. In July 1967, the company became unprofitable and lost their leading position in the market to Texas Instruments. In March 1968, Moore and Noyce decided to leave Fairkilt and again, as nine years prior, turned to Arthur Rock. In the summer of 1968, they founded MM Electronics. Blank, Greinick, Kleiner, Last, Uerny, and Roberts set aside the past disagreements and financially supported the company of Moore and Noyce. A year later, MM Electronics bought the trade name rights from the hotel chain Intelco and took the name of Intel. Moore held senior positions at Intel until 1997 when he was named Chairman Emeritus of Intel Corporation. Noyce left Intel in 1987 to lead the non-profit consortium Semitech. He died suddenly in 1990, the first of the eight. Greinick left Fairkild in 1968 for a short sabbatical and then taught at UC Berkeley and Stanford, where he published the first comprehensive textbook on integrated circuits. He later co-founded and ran several companies developing industrial radio frequency identification, RFID, tags. Blank was the last of the eight to leave Fairkild in 1969. He founded the financial firm Zika specializing in innovative startups, and in 2004 sold it for $529 million. Huerni headed Amelco until the summer of 1963 and, after the conflict with the Teledyne owners, for three years headed Union Carbide Electronics. In July 1967, Supported by the watch company Societe Suisse pour l'Industrie Horlogeria, the predecessor of Swatch Group, founded Intersil, the company that created the market for custom CMOS circuits. The circuits developed by Intersil for Psycho in 1969-1970 contributed to the rise of Japanese electronic watches. Intersil and Intel weren't competitors as Intel released a limited set of template circuits for computers and sold them initially only in the US market, whereas Intersil focused on custom CMOS circuits with low power consumption and sold them worldwide. Last remained with Amelco and for 12 years served as Vice President of Technology at Teledyne. In 1982, he founded Hillcrest Press specializing in art books. After leaving Amelco, Roberts led his own business, and in 1973-1987 served as a trustee of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Amelco, after numerous mergers, acquisitions, and renaming, became a subsidiary of Microchip Technology. In 1972, Kleiner and Tom Perkins from Hewlett Packard founded the venture capital fund Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Bias which has been involved in the creation and forward slash or funding of Amazon.com, Compaq, Genentech, Intuit, Lotus, Macromedia, Netscape, Sun Microsystems, Symantec and dozens of other companies. Kleiner later wrote that his goal was to geographically spread the venture financing. Honors, edit. In May, 2011, the California Historical Society gave the Legends of California Award to the eight. Blank, Last, Moore, and Robert's son Dave attended the event in San Francisco. Fair Cauldron, Edit. Fair Cauldron redirects here. For the 2015 album, see Fair Cauldron, Album. For other uses, see Fair Killed, Disambiguation. In research, reporting, and popular law related to Silicon Valley, the term Fair Cauldron has been used to refer to 1. The corporate spin-offs created by former employees of Fairkilt Semiconductor. This usage was propagated by historian Leslie Berlin through her 2001 review article, PhD thesis, and biography of Robert Noyce. 
to the founders of such firms. This is the earliest usage, for example, in the 1978 BBC Horizon documentary Now the Chips Are Down, Tom Wolfe's 1983 profile of noise or a 5,000 word profile of Silicon Valley in 1999. Three former Fairkilt semiconductor employees, as in a 1988 New York Times article. For the original founders of Fairkilt Semiconductor, more commonly known as the Traitorous Eight. This has been used by the PBS website and a book by Blasi et al. One of the first articles to identify Fairkilt as the parent of so many spin-offs appeared in Innovation magazine in 1969. The spin-off companies, such as AMD, Intel, Intercell and Restructured National Semiconductor, were different from those of the East Coast and California's electronic companies established in the 1940s and 1950s. Old Californians like Beckman and Varian Associates did not trust Wall Street and kept control of their companies for decades, whereas the new companies of the 1960s were created for a quick, within three five years, public sale of shares. Their founders built a business strategy based on the expectations of the investment banks. Another characteristic of Silicon Valley was the mobility of managers and professionals among companies. Partly because of noise, Silicon Valley developed a culture of openly denying the hierarchical culture of traditional corporations. People remained faithful to each other, but not to the employer or the industry. Their killed alumni can be found not only in electronics related but also financial and public relations companies. See also, edit. One Chitang Sa, another former employee under William Shockley who later joined Fairkilt Semiconductor, where he co-developed CMOS along with Frank Juan Laswell at Fairkilt. Two Mohamed Attila, inventor of the MOSFET, MOS transistor, former Bell Labs employee who later joined Fairkilt Semiconductor. Three Nifty 50 group of 50 companies on the New York Stock Exchange in the 1960s 1970s. Four PayPal Mafia, former PayPal employees who founded a number of technology companies. Notes, edit.